Welcome back. Um, we're going to be talking today about the Robotino's uh, global variables and we're going to be talking about the steps. How you can have multiple windows with different steps in each window, that is different programs in each window, and how to move through them. So let's start talking about global variables. A global variable is a variable which is a name. It can be a floating point or a binary, a Boolean number, any kind of a number that is used through all of your programs. It's globally accessible from all programs. To create a global variable, you move to this little area here it says variables. You right click on it and you say add. I'm going to create a new variable and I'm going to call it alpha with a capital A. And this is where I choose what kind of variable it is. A string, a floating vector, a float. So we're going to leave it as a floating point number. Now you notice over in the variables, two variables have shown up. One of them is a reader. Now this is an output that shows what value was shown, was stored in that variable. So this output here can be used as an input to something else. And there's also a writer. This is where you change the variable to whatever it is you want to change it to. So I'm going to just delete this reader and we'll look at the writer. We're going to take the writer and we're going to go to uh, create a uh, some number to put in there. I'm going to use the timer. So we'll take the timer. It gives us a nice interesting number and we'll put it into the variable. So show connector values and if I was to run it you can see the timer goes up and the input to alpha goes up. I'll just stop that. Now over here uh, we see steps. These are steps, these square boxes and the steps are joined by transitions and the transitions will move you from one step to another step. Each step refers to one of these tabbed programs. So you can see we have one step here and that is associated with this step here. When we're running that program, when it's green, this step becomes highlighted in black to tell you that it's actually uh, the executing step. I'll stop that. We can select this step here and then add on another step below that and we have step 2. Now there's no tab yet, but when I double click on step 2, um, a new subprogram is created and I'm going to call that subprogram step 2. So now you can see a new tab. We have step 1 which is associated with this tab, step 1, and step 2 associated with this tab, step 2. The transition that takes it from step 1 to step 2 has to be true. Now in this case it's false. It's always false. So you never leave step 1. So what we're going to do now, we have step 1 right here and we have a timer going into this variable called alpha. So why don't we have it fall from step 1 uh, to step 2 when the timer is greater than a thousand milliseconds, one second. So to go from step 1 to step 2 we want the timer to be greater than a thousand milliseconds. So we're going to go double click on the false statement and we're going to say alpha, and you have to get the case right, alpha is greater than 1000. So if alpha is greater than 1000, fall into step two. Okay, now let's go to step two and we're going to create a similar little process in here. I'll stick a clock in, we'll put the clock in as before. We'll create a new variable, a global variable, we'll call it beta. That's better. And uh, the beta writer, we'll put right here. We will view the values so we can see what numbers are actually stored in there and connect those two functions together. Now, um, in the main program, Let's leave step two and return back to the initial step. This is just a, a blank initial step. It doesn't actually conform to any tabs here. And it'll automatically fall into step one because this is always true. So let's have it leave step two and go back to step one when beta is greater than, well, let's say 2,000, two seconds. So I'm going to say beta is greater than 2,000. Now uh, we're going to execute this program. Now you notice you're in step one right now for a second, then it moves to step two. Back to step one, back to step two. And you can see as the steps are being executed, 
a little green light comes on on the tab. A one second light here and a two second light for step two. A one second light for one step one, two second light for step two. We can go into step one and when it's active you can actually see it running. But when you leave step one the counter automatically goes back to zero. Okay, and there's our global variable and this variable is being read by this transition and will move from step one to step two. So what can we do now that we have this? Well, let's try uh, getting some motion out of our robot. We'll have it go forward while it's in step one and we'll have it go backwards while it's in step two. So quickly, I'll go to my drive system. I'll lay out three motors and my Omni drive and we will connect the three motors to the Omni drive in the standard fashion and let's just take a constant just a simple constant and we'll tie it to the VX input of the motor again we can go view connector descriptions and you can see the top connection is VX and we'll give it a velocity of 100 in the X direction. Now, we'll go to step two and we'll recreate this. In this case, it's simpler for me just to copy this. Copy, and I'll go into step two and we will paste that entire code fragment in. And in this case, uh, I'm going to make it go backwards at half the speed at a speed of 50 and it'll be doing that for two seconds so it'll go forward 100 for one second and backwards 50 for two seconds alright now here we can see here we can see our robot so let's connect to this robot we'll put it in the 127.0.0.1 Call an 8080, which is the loopback address. We'll enable it, and let's have a look at our robot. It goes fast forward for one second, slowly backwards for two seconds. So you can see, while it's in step two, this reversing code is operating, and while it's in step one, the forward code is operating. So this gives you a basic idea of how to create uh, these different steps and how to make a, your first sequential function chart. This, this process is called a sequential function chart. Now you can name these steps anything you like. I can take this step one, right click on it, and I can call it forward. And I can take step two, right click on it, and I can call that one backward. You can see forward and backward self-explanatory. Step one is forward, step two is backwards. And if you run it, while it's in step one, you're moving forward, and while it's in step two, you're moving backwards.